right. So tonight is lesson nine on what we have been calling truths for life. And uh, these are about the uh, ordinances of Pentecostal churches. Uh, we have been specifically looking at Pentecostal Church of God ordinances, but most of those are very similar to other organizations that are Pentecostal organizations like Assemblies of God, Foursquare, different ones like that, independent Pentecostal churches, different things. So we've talked about the need for ordinances, we've talked about uh, salvation, we've talked about the last two weeks we talked about being in filled with the Holy Spirit, last week we talked about speaking in tongues, uh, and this week we're going to talk about sanctification. How many uh, remember back in the day when people would get up and they would testify and they say, I thank God that I'm saved, thank sanctified, you. and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what they'd say. Uh, that was always a good testimony. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about is being holy. Being holy, which is that sanctification. What does that mean? So God wants us to live holy lives. It's spelled out in Scripture. Uh, he tells us that. Uh, but that is something that we have to work on and that the Holy Spirit works with us in. Uh, not just our works, not just the Holy Spirit working in us, but a combination uh, of us working alongside in unity with the Holy Spirit. This is what sanctification is about. Questions we may ask, how can sinful people live holy lives? Uh, we're going to look at that tonight. So, don't let outward appearances fool you. Some people may look very holy and appear very holy, but I would say that all of us struggle with sin in some form or fashion. Maybe not the same struggle with sin or temptation, but uh, all of us, the Bible even says, if we say that we have no sin, then we're a liar. So then we're a sinner, right? Uh, or we're sinning, I should say. This uh, sanctification. Each and every Christian uh, struggles with this at times. Most Christians want to live a righteous life, but end up doing things that we know displeases God. Uh, and it's possible for us to even wonder if it is possible to live a life that is truly pleasing to God. But we know that it is, because the Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we have faith, and the Bible even tells us that God's given us a measure of faith, then we can please God. What are we looking at at this word sanctification? Sanctification is an act of separating. So separating is that first key word. Separating from that which is evil. Now, that is not enough in itself, right? Because we can separate from evil, and evil things and evil people and the evil world, but I mean, knows that we still have ourselves to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and mankind, the Bible tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked. So uh, we have to work on ourselves, along with the Holy Spirit doing that along with us. So sanctification is an act of separating from that which is evil and of dedication unto God. Dedication. There's that next word there. The Bible says that we will draw near to God, that he'll draw near to us, right? Uh, so this is that act of drawing near to God and, draw, and God drawing near to us. And the good thing about God is how many of us that sometimes we can draw near to people, but then they'll back away because maybe they're not ready for whatever that may incorporate relationship, friendship, whatever it might be possible for people to back away. But God says he doesn't do that, right? If we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. Sanctification is actually separating from that which is evil and a dedication, or you could say drawing near uh, unto God. So scripture teaches us without a life of holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to obey the command. And this is the command. He says, be holy. This is the Lord speaking to us because I'm holy, right? Well, that seems like a big task, right? But without the Holy Spirit, we would struggle. Sanctification is realized in the believer by recognizing his identification 
with Christ in his death and resurrection. What does that say? A couple of weeks ago, as I was preaching, I was talking about being in Christ and Christ being in us. Uh, and that's the only way for us to live a holy life. Uh, we cannot do it on our own. We cannot try hard enough, enough, be good enough, act good enough, any of those things, but it's by our identification with him in his death and resurrection. If you've been baptized, uh, you symbolically went through that death as we dumped you underwater and that resurrection as we raised you up, right? That when we identify with Christ in that, then it's possible for us to live a holy life. It's through that union and then continually asking the Holy Spirit to have dominion of us. What does that mean? If I say, does the Holy Spirit have dominion of you, what does that mean? Does he take over your whole, encompass your whole, right? Uh, does he have all authority? Are you uh, trying to allow him to have all authority? Are we being submissive to the Holy Spirit, right? It's this working alongside of the Holy Spirit. There's some teachings about sanctification, uh, some disagreements revolving around uh, the timing and the process of sanctification. So I'll tell you what we believe in our doctrine, what we believe, and then what some other folks believe. Some people teach that sanctification is a second distinct experience that transpires after salvation. So if you remember those words, it sounds like being filled with the Holy Spirit, because we said the Holy being baptized in the Holy Spirit was a second distinct work uh, that could accompany salvation. Uh, so some people teach that. Uh, we do not teach that. Sanctification is not instantly achieved holiness according to our beliefs. So it's not instantly that we become holy, right? So others believe that sanctification occurs when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The problem with both of those views is that it identifies or pulls out a point in time when a person is no longer influenced by sin. Now the Bible tells us that we're not slaves to sin, but it does not tell us that we are never tempted to sin or that we never ever sin, right? Now you may be sitting there and saying, well, Pastor, I don't remember the last time I sinned, purposefully sinned, didn't do what God told me to do in his word. Uh, but sometimes there's acts of committing sin and acts of omitting to do what God's called us to do. I may ever bypass what the Lord told you to do. Uh, and so I see some head shaking. Nobody's ever, we, sometimes we're like, eh, I'd rather really not do that, Lord. And then sometimes he kind of disciplines us later. Our church doesn't believe that there's a point in time that God removes person's tendency to sin. Instead, we believe in what is called, or often referred to as progressive sanctification. Okay? So our church believes in progressive sanctification is the positive way of saying that. And we're going to talk about that. Progressive means it's continuing on. What's this saying is, when you get saved, or even when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, that you don't instantaneously become totally sin-free. But what this is saying is that there's a process. I mean, knows that word works in process, right? Mm -hmm. Works in progress, or whatever you want to say that. Uh, at Sylvania, we used to have whip. Work in process. Uh, sometimes we had way too much of that because, uh, you know, the base didn't get put on something or... Okay, but anyway, we had, we had works in process. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so that's what this is talking about. It's a progressive sanctification. In progressive sanctification, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts a person of a specific sin. Lust. So we have a, a struggle with lust, uh, looking at other people, looking at things uh, that we shouldn't. That's a specific conviction that the Holy Spirit can bring to you, start to convict your heart, and then 
you along with the Holy Spirit begin to work on that. The Holy Spirit doesn't typically, although I've heard people say things like, I used to be an alcoholic when I went to the altar. God instantly removed the desire and the taste for alcohol. So we're not saying that God can't do this, but what we are saying is the Holy Spirit works progressively with us through dealing with these specific temptations and sins uh, in our life. So he's continually working with that, and if the person responds with the heart of repentance, then they uh, may move, the Holy Spirit may move on to another area in our life to deal with us with. I haven't got to the completed mark yet. And I probably won't till we get to heaven, right? Uh, but the Holy Spirit's always working with us. Aren't you thankful that he is? I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm surely not what I used to be, right? Uh, and that's one thing that when we're saved that we can, we can testify of, right? Uh, that the Holy Spirit's working with us. And the Holy Spirit, you said it throughout this teaching, is a gentleman. So the Holy Spirit lovingly convicts and draws us to God. And then if we have a heart of repentance, uh, then we're able to work together with the Holy Spirit to uh, remove that from our lives and being transformed. And the goal is to become increasingly more and more like Jesus. That's what he wants us to, to be, right? So that when the world sees us, they see a difference. Now, you may say, oh, well, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not perfect yet, So, I'm, but the world will see a difference. If there's any difference, they're going to see a difference, right? Even if we're still a work in process, but God's dealing with us, and we're drawing near to him, and he's drawing near to us, and we're Maybe we're working on, maybe our struggle was with how to love people, right? Maybe we, we, we had a problem of, uh, with loving people like we ought to love them. Uh, then the Holy Spirit will deal with us with that. And as we change, people will notice the difference. Hopefully, right? The key to sanctification is the believer's desire to live rightly and to be willing to do the work that it takes to achieve getting through this particular sin and overcoming it. Now, don't stress out when I say work, because at no point did I say that your, saint, that your salvation was achieved by works. But sanctification is a work in process of the Holy Spirit and us coming in, uh, in uh, fellowship and union with the Holy Spirit to work on our life. Uh, so that's what progressive sanctification is about. What are some things that you can do to help you live a more holy life? Simple things. What are some things that we can do? Pray. Read your Bible. Absolutely. Pray. Yes. Come to Bible study, she said. Because there's something about that fellowship as well, where we break the word together, where we fellowship, where we uh, worship together. Uh, so these are all things or any others. So all of these things help us because they're sources for us to hear God's voice, right? The Word is, is God's voice, His Word. Uh, whenever we open up so the sword of the Spirit, uh, it's God's Word. And when we come into fellowship with one another and the Holy Spirit's moving amongst us and the Word's being preached or taught or uh, there's worship going on, then God works on us. Have you ever walked out of a, a church service and it wasn't even, you don't have to say it wasn't because of my preaching, but it, it might not have been the preaching. It might have been the fellowship. You felt loved. It might have been the worship. You just felt deeper and closer with the Lord, you know. Uh, so it, it's all of these things are sources for us to begin to live a more holy life along with the Holy Spirit working within us. And that's how he does that. At times, the sanctification process can be painful, but it's worth the pain because our goal is to become a vessel that can be used by the Master. If you, if you want to be used by God, then there's a process of growth and maturity and sanctification 
uh, that you go through and God will use a, a, a clean vessel, right? Uh, he uh, will, is able to more use you in, in uh, certain things. So it can be painful as we deal with the sins in our life, uh, but we want to be uh, willing and open and beautiful vessels for the Lord. So what's the lesson for us? Don't be discouraged. If you're struggling with sin, remember that you're a work in process. So how do we, what do we do? We call on the Holy Spirit. We ask him to help us with specific sins. I, I'm not going to tell you what your specific area of temptation or sin might be, but the Holy Spirit will. And as he, it, as he reveals that to you, if you pray and simply ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that, he will. Right? So that's a part of uh, that process as we surrender ourselves. We're willing uh, to surrender to the Lord's will. And uh, we'll never be perfect, but yet we don't have to be enslaved to sin. We do have hope in the Lord. Amen? Uh, so the doctrine of sanctification. We've been talking about we're working with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's working with us. I'm going to sum this up in one sentence. The doctrine of sanctification tells us how to find the balance between spiritual laziness and trying to do it all ourselves. So there's a process of growing and maturing in the Lord. Some people expect just because maybe they haven't been taught any better, uh, but when they get saved, they you know they they may think, well, I'm never gonna have to deal with sin again. I'm gonna be perfect. I'm gonna be just like Jesus. Uh, if that happens for you, praise the Lord because you're about one out of a million, right? So it's a work. It is not about being just surrendering to the Lord, but when you surrender. To do what the Holy Spirit asks of you to do, and how to deal uh, with our with our sin and deal with ourselves. So I'm going to read from Romans chapter six, of verse one through thirteen. And we're going to look at the Scripture and what it has to say about sanctification. And what you're going to see is this working, this duality of working, us working with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working with us, right? And some of the scriptures will talk about what God will do in us, and some will talk about what we need to do, right? Uh, so we're going to read some scriptures here tonight uh, that talk about this. You probably read this particular scripture, Romans chapter 6. I'll quickly read verses 1 through 13. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So this is saying we ought to have a new life, right? Uh, that we're not to just keep sinning in order that God, uh, would his grace would abound. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So this is telling us we're not slaves to sin. The old man, man has been put to death. But yet, how many knows that it's hard to give up uh, and to change our ways and our habits? That, that's this process of sanctification. We're no longer bound by sin, no longer enslaved to it, but yet there is a process of working with the Holy Spirit, uh, as he's talking about here. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. But knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. 
Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You're dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is this saying? If it's saying I'm dead to sin, how do I have the capacity to ever sin? How, how do we reckon this? Uh, yeah, we can let uh, the, the sinful flesh and the temptations of the world and all that kind of stuff uh, kind of pop up its up its ugly head, and then we gotta we gotta kill it along with the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let it, is what it says. So there's some work that we gotta do, right? If it rises up, we gotta kill it because it's supposed to be dead anyway, right? So it says here, that's what our, our part. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God. So remember it says, kill it, but now present yourself to God. Uh, I'm reading from verse 13. As being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So there's this back and forth in the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, we'll read some more, that talks about our part in sanctification and God's part in the Holy Spirit's part in sanctification. Now, who does the most? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is doing the biggest work. We're simply cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2, 12, and 13. I'm going to summarize it. Simply says, work out your own salvation. What do you mean work it out? I thought God already worked it out. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to do his will and to do his good pleasure. Wow. So, work it out, but yet God's working in you. All these scriptures are saying the same thing when you get down to it, uh, that it is a that sanctification is a work both that I participate in and I surrender to the Holy Spirit, yet God is also doing a work in me, right? That sanctification is a process of heart and life transformation. Although the power of sin has been broken, the presence of sin still remains. When you're in this world, there will always be sin remaining. There is the curse of sin that is still here. There's the temptation of sin. All of that doesn't mean you have to be overcome by sin, but the presence of sin is just around us, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to do much to see the presence of sin in our world. Simply flip on the TV for a few minutes. Turn on your Facebook or whatever it is that you might uh, look at. God is not satisfied with me living in the condition of sin, although I have a legal standing that he has changed me. So my legal standing is that I'm saved, I'm washed by the blood of Christ, this is my legal standing. I am made acceptable, I'm a child of the living God, these are all my legal standings. But yet, when we're in this world, we still have a struggle with sin. That's my legal st uh, standing is with him. I've heard people say this, and I do like it. God still loves me when I sin, but he loves me enough to want me to change and to become something different than what I was, right? That's that process. So, what's the work of the Holy Spirit in this? How does the Holy Spirit work in us? God uses, and we talked about this two weeks ago, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. So God uses the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to convict me of sin. So that sin bothers me. When you are not enslaved to sin, and it is not a normal part of your life, by the way, if you're a Christian, Sinning all the time should be abnormal, right? And it should bother you when you sin, right? It should, the Holy Spirit convict you. 
the Holy Spirit is um, has a crucial role in our lives because without it, we're never going to have a conviction to say that this is wrong or this is right. We'll just keep on living, thinking that what we're doing is uh, right. So that conviction of the Holy Spirit is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's not the judgment of God, but it's God drawing us nearer to Him. And how does He do that? Not only through the power of the Holy Spirit, and convicting us, but He uses His Word to move me forward in my Christian walk. What does your Bible tell you? It tells you how you should love, what you should hate. By the way, it's never people. Right? But there are things that the Bible says to hate. And we're not going to go into all those. What our desires should be. How we should speak. So he uses his word to do that. And he also uses his church to help us. How many could testify that you'd not be as far along in your Christian walk without being a part of a church? Right? Mm -hmm. In a fellowship, yeah. right? Uh, there's a reason why the Bible tells us to not forsake assembly. It's not because Jesus is up there taking a roll. Well, Brian missed a day. Well, he was just being good. He was bad today. You know, it, that's not what it's about. It's about what we gain from being together that we cannot do when we're apart. We cannot corporately worship apart from other people. We cannot corporately pray apart from other people. And by the way, when you pray at home, that's great prayer. And you ought to pray at home, and you ought to pray everywhere you go, and when you get up, all those kind of things. But praying together, like when we pray at church, it's powerful. And you see God move and do, and do things. Because it, it's a part of his word that tells us when two or three are gathered together, he's going to be there, but also that if any two agree upon any one thing, that God will do it. That has to do with being in God's will and his uh, will for that. So Hebrews 12, 14 says, Without holiness, no man can see the Lord. So we want to be holy. And this is this comes, by the way, you can look this up right in on our website. If you go to crosswalkchurchky.com, but there's a there's a tab that tells us about. It says about, and then you go to the, the Drop down tab that says what we believe. And this comes directly from there uh, in the part about sanctification. It says this the Bible teaches that without holiness no man can see the Lord. We believe in the doctrine of sanctification as a definite yet progressive work of grace. Okay? Commencing at the time of regeneration. That's saying it starts whenever you get saved. And continuing into the consummation of salvation. When is our salvation? Consummated. When we get to heaven. Right? We were saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. It's that process uh, of uh, salvation. How would we define sanctification? How would we define sanctification? Somebody give me... When, you, when I say sanctification, what do you think about? Set apart is one of those. What about another word? Set apart. Separated is one of those. Make holy. Word we don't use too often is consecrate or dedicate. Those are all words that line up with uh, this definition of sanctification. And then there's one... Uh, and it's a longer definition, but I'm just going to say the manifestation of life produced by the indwelling Holy Spirit. When, the, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He will automatically start this process working in you and sanctifying your life. And we'll go ahead and go through the question. So, all right, just fill in the blank here. Holler it out. Sanctification is an act of separating, separating from that which is evil and of dedication. dedication. Right, unto God. Our church believes in progressive sanctification. Very good. 
The doctrine of tells us how to find the balance between spiritual and trying to do it all ourselves. Number four, God uses the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to convict me of so that it bothers me, right? So, and then we just went through defining sanctification. Some of those words were set apart, dedicate, consecrate, separate, to make holy, and then this life that is manifested by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. 